Hi, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Red Hat Summit here in Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Paul Gillen. We are joined by Francis Chow. He's the VP and GM of In-Vehicle Operating System and Edge at Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank the you Cube. for having me, Rebecca and Paul. So before the cameras were rolling, we were talking about uh, just all the excitement here that we are, we are we're seeing and we're hearing about with medical breakthroughs and technological innovations, and we're here today to talk to you about uh, autonomous vehicles. If you want to give us really, really a high level of where we stand with autonomous vehicles and, and, and where we're at right now, we really had thought they'd be a reality by now, they're not. Well, I, I think uh, I'll probably step back a little bit. Um, uh, instead of talking about autonomous vehicle, which is really, I think, a, a facet of the whole picture, which we generally talk about software-defined vehicle. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll probably use that term right, for the rest of the uh, interview. The industry has been talking about software-defined vehicle for probably a decade. Um, and there, I think, many steps from the traditional way of designing vehicle to the nirvana of, okay, full autonomous driving. Uh, and there are many milestones along the way. I think we're getting maybe about a third of the way. Uh, there's definitely a lot of technical challenges that we're working through with the ecosystem and the industry. Uh, there's always a balance of safety, security, and features, and time to market. And then there's also uh, some more longer term issues, including legal or ethics issues as you get into a full autonomous driving. So I would say the industry is definitely moving progress. Um, uh, part of the challenge is that the traditional way of designing vehicles are no longer scalable and sustainable. And I think there's general consensus in the industry that open source could be an enabler for that transformation, and this is why we're here. Uh, the vehicle industry is notoriously proprietary. Everyone does things their own way. How receptive have they been to this idea of using open source at a fundamental level like this? I think there's definitely a transformation that the industry have to go through. It is, I would say it's almost a necessity. If you think about how car has been designed for the past 40, 50 years, can you imagine uh, in like an IT industry where every time you have a new model in a new production year, you almost have to redesign the, the software stack, right? But this is what the industry have been going through. So I think we're getting to a point that the demand for uh, even driver assistant systems, more personalized infotainment uh, features, uh, digital cockpit that you know, give you more, more personalized driving experience, these are getting to a point that the software complexity can no longer be managed by a single kind of closed source vendor systems. And I think one of the ways to kind of solve that is to uh, allow the non-differentiating features of the stack to be open source because you know, whether using Linux distribution A or B doesn't really make a difference in the driving uh, or, or driver's decisions on the purchase decisions. But these are the stuff that uh, you know, Red Hat along with you know, some other companies can help the industry uh, make it easier to design uh, new software architectures. Can you talk through some of the innovations that you're working on now that will help transform the automotive industry? Yes, so one of the, um, I think, critical change the industry is going through is how do they make software development and deployment more scalable? Because in the past, you design your car software, you get it to production, you forget about it, right? There's no need for updates and upgrades. In software-defined vehicle, we're talking about frequent updates and upgrades. It's almost like your phone, right? New apps going to be downloaded from time to time. The OS need to be updated from time to time. And so what we're trying to bring is the experience that we have with enterprise, which we have been supporting mission-critical applications across multiple industries, like healthcare, airlines, banks. They require as much quality, reliability, and security as the automotive industry does. So we're trying to bring that expertise over. Now one key thing that we are working on is functional safety certification. Because we do need to have that safety certification in order for us to be part of the vehicle technology stack. So this is the big piece that I think we bring to market and it's really one unique differentiation that we think 
we can help with the market. What, uh, maybe you can back up a step. What is a software-defined vehicle? I think uh, there are many definitions, as you can imagine, uh, but my definition would be a software-defined uh, vehicle is really a car that allows frequent update and update, uh, upgrades of software and services. And the design methodology is no longer hardware-centric or waterfall-like approach that's in the past, but more like agile, like modern software system architecture and design methodologies. Where do you see the innovation taking place? I mean, what do you see in, on the drawing board right now at automakers that makes you go, wow? I think it's the thinking about how the car interact with the rest of the ecosystem. Because if you think about a software-defined car, it's really not just about the car anymore, right? It's about how the car talks to the infrastructure. How does it talk to edge operating centers? How does it talk to the cloud? Because in the end, there will be a lot of data that will probably be drawn from the vehicle and be analyzed in the, in the cloud. There will be a lot of updates and upgrades that are going to be sent from the operating center to, to the vehicle. And, and I think what's exciting is, is how we can unify that design architecture so that the same applications can run in the car as in the cloud. Not a big surprise for IT markets, but it's a big change for the automotive market. How do you utilize the same tools to design all the functional domains in a car, which wasn't the case before? I think those principles that I think has been solved in IT for a while, then we, now we're trying to bring those into the industry. Well, before, before the cameras were rolling, we were talking about your career, and this is a relatively new area for you, and, and you described yourself as, as a change maker, and this, this is what you specialize in, is change management. How do you approach this, as you, as you were just saying, it requires cultural change um, to think through these things and to be prepared for them. How do you approach the kinds of changes that are needed within the automotive industry and also within Red Hat too, to, to, to make some of these innovations realities? It's, it's definitely a very exciting, uh, personally. I, I think, as in many changes um, in technologies uh, and in companies, we need to identify partners and ecosystems because no one can do it alone. So uh, what we've been trying to do is to find like-minded companies and innovators in more, maybe more traditional companies and hey, how can we work together to, to bring this to fruition? And a lot of things that Red Hat is pretty good at is to work with communities where there are a lot of automotive communities that we've been working with in the past three years to try to bring some of these concepts into fruition, including uh, organizations like SOFI, uh, Eclipse SDV, and ELISA for safety. So we're trying to share our knowledge and know-how with the community, take input and feedback, and then try to bring that together. How do you think AI is changing the game and what you do? I think it's going to probably impact the industry in, in a multiple ways. Uh, similar to actually what we talked about in the keynote yesterday, uh, there will be AI algorithms. In fact, uh, some of that has been happening in the vehicle for the past couple of years. When you talk about uh, advanced driver assistance systems, there's AI in it because you need to make decisions uh, like a human. Um, we are seeing some even chatbot type of features in certain uh, vehicles. Um, and it's actually pretty interesting because they are asking you as a driver what you want the car to do and you can talk with it with natural languages and even provide feedback on what you want the product to look like in the future. So you got real feed, you know, real time update on, on, on feature requests from, from your customer base. And I think in terms of tooling, AI can also improve the design tools to make some of the software designs quicker and, and faster. When it comes to safety, do you anticipate that we will see an increase in safety. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about the, the harrowing statistics we're seeing about distracted driving, and my daughter is on the cusp of getting her driver's license very soon, and, and, um, and having her on the road with these machines that are making decisions in ways that I don't know. Is it better to have a machine making a decision or a human? I mean, how, what do you foresee as sort of the future of roadway safety? I think there will probably be um a transition, right? Um, the, in the near future, I would say probably the next five to 10 years, 
I would say human assisted driving is still required. Um, and in the same time, I think uh, the industry, in fact, right, there's some uh, forums and communities, for example, we are part of uh, a World Economic Forum initiative to talk about these problems. And one of the uh, um, uh, things that we talked about recently was, uh, it's actually a challenge because every car makers have a different human interface for assisted driving. Now think about if you own you know, a certain car brand and you change your car. Or you it's rent a, a car. Or it's, not like a, it's not like you know, a computer. Experience, right? right? It's not like a right. GUI. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do we make it easier? Because that's part of safety. It's not just technology, but it's how the vehicle interact with humans. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention that your title also includes edge computing, which is a great many more use cases. What are some of the more interesting edge computing field applications you're working on right now? Um, we, we're looking at our edge broadly, because uh, we think uh, similar to automotive, what we're seeing is there are multiple industries that are getting to a point where they require a transformation, and they all sort of agree that open source would be one of the enablers of those transformations. So we've been investing heavily in manufacturing, retail, energy infrastructure, because those are the industry that we see transformation is at the pivotal point of change. So we're working with our partners and ecosystems to build solutions that would fit uh, the needs. And I think some of the changes that we're seeing is there are uh, definitely a change of like decades old model. Uh, for example, uh, for manufacturing, there's a well-known model called the Purdue model. Um, how do you segregate a control system into different layers of control? Uh, uh, from a device level to your data acquisitions, to your uh, execution systems. Some of that is probably going to collapse and change so that they can take advantage of new IT concepts. And uh, some of the cool things that we've been uh, talking about and working with, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, we're partnering with a, a company called Insight uh, in, in Europe and we're implementing a solution where they can use AI, we talk about AI all day, uh, so that the their wind farms can detect flying birds, they can change the speed of that turbine to avoid collisions of the birds. Wow, yeah. right. Isn't that cool? That's very cool. Eliminating one of Donald Trump's major objections. <laughs> exactly, he won't have, anything, he won't have any more complaints. <laughs> um, Final thoughts, what, I mean, had, had, this conversation has been so illuminating and, and, and fascinating. What do you think is, is on tap for the year ahead and what are going to be the top conversation topics of next year's Red Hat Summit? As you said, AI is obviously the buzzword this year and it will continue to be next year too. But what is on the horizon that you're most excited about? I think, um, I think the intersection of AI and, and the edge would probably be it might not be next year, but it probably be down the road be a very exciting area. Because in the end, if you think about what's most probable of leveraging AI, is where the action happens. Right? The action happens at the edge, not at the cloud where the AI models are being trained. And if you think about where the data is, the data is at the edge. So why not training the model at the edge, leveraging the data at the edge, and then deploy it where the model and the data is generated? And I think with advancements in shrinking of model sizes, with advancement in uh, increasing of compute power of small devices, uh, with uh, advancements of uh, uh, kind of other factors of technologies, we, we, I think we're going to see a, a boom in AI inferencing at the edge. So, I'll put you on the spot and ask you for a prediction. Does a child born, will a child born today have to learn how to drive? Um, good question. Very good question. Uh, as, as a parent, uh, I, I think it's a good skill to have, just like screaming, uh, but it, it might not be a necessity. And it could become a, a leisure thing, just like I would love to a drive hobby. because it's fun to do. Yep. Right, right, it'll be a hobby. Yes. For, for, for our grandchildren. Yes. Excellent. Well, Francis, this, is, this, is, this has been really fun. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Paul. I'm Rebecca Knight for Paul Gillen. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise coverage.